Welcome back to Quantitative Anthro Analysis in Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and if you couldn't tell, I have a terrible hat head today because it's cold and snowy in Northeast Wisconsin. Okay, today we're on topic two, lesson two on the normal curve. This is a kind of in-between lesson. We, look, we talked about how to visualize data last time. We're going to talk about measures of central tendency next time. And the normal curve is one of those things that I find very effective in visualizing measures of central tendency. So I'm putting this in here as one of the ways to help you learn to visualize statistics. I also think that it is a really useful thing to understand well. A lot of times the normal curve is discussed in sections of statistics courses on probability or probability theory. We're not doing that in here. So this is a good time to do it. The normal distribution is what's expected for any trait in a natural population. So the good one for humans is height. We expect there to be a range of heights in a human population and that is going to form, create what we call a normal curve. That normal curve is based on, and this is the probability piece, something called the central limit theorem that we're not going to go into, but it is based on a probability theory. And it is basic to essentially all statistics for interval and ordinal data that we are going to talk about in this class. The um, statistics for nominal data is based on a, a different set of hypotheses or a different set of theorems. But basically, according to the central limit theorem, if you have a continuously distributed trait in a, in a natural population, it will, and, and then you, you visualize it on a, a graph, a histogram, rather, on a histogram, uh, you'll get this thing that is magical. And I'll show you why that's going to look like this. Any trait we can think about along that axis, this is numbers. So this is a histogram. In a normal population of a continuously distributed trait, the numbers are going to look like that. There's going to be only a very few individuals at the low end of that continuously distributed trait. Lots of people in the center, and that's the central limit theorem, that's what tells us that. And lots of, or very, very few people that score very high on that trait. This concept that there is very few who score low on a continuously distributed trait, very few that score high on a continuously distributed trait, and lots in the middle is the basis of virtually all of the statistics uh, for interval and, ordin and ordinal data that we're going to be talking about. And you'll understand that very well by the end of the class. Where's the magic? Well, here it is. We know, based on a score, where an individual falls in this normal curve. Why is that magical? Because that allows us to describe that individual, at least on that characteristic, in regards to the rest of the population by the percentage or proportion of that population that is, that's different from them. So, let's say height. If you are, oh, I don't know what's in here, six feet tall, you can say with great accuracy that that person is, let's say, taller than 90% of this population and shorter than 10% of that population. That's really important because it can tell us a whole lot about an individual if we use multiple traits. We can put that person in context of a population 
with great accuracy. Okay. I want to go back to what we talked about first. That anthropologists tend to not like statistics because what some argue is that it tends to put people in boxes and categorize them when in fact we know that everyone is unique and special. Here's what I would argue. This allows us to describe a person with great precision in terms of their very uniqueness. In other words, using a normal curve and a set of continuously distributed traits, we can describe a person's uniqueness with great accuracy. We can do, I would say, for some traits, not all, but for many things, we can talk about a person with much greater precision. We can discuss their uniqueness with much greater precision using numbers in this way than with words. And the combination of words and numbers allows us to talk about the great diversity of life, the great diversity of humanity, in an exquisite way that neither words nor numbers can do alone. The combination of those lets us talk with great precision and eloquence about diversity, about difference, about the great myriad of life uh, in human cultures that's out there. And that's why I love statistics as an anthropologist and why I think all anthropologists should embrace statistics as a way of not categorizing and limiting the way we talk about people, but as a way of expanding the way we can talk about people. All right, that's my little shtick for, for right now. So here's a real normal distribution. This is, if we go back, this is an ideal distribution. We'll talk more about this in the next lesson. This is a, a, a real distribution. And one of the things to note is that it's not perfect. And in any real case scenario, those distributions don't follow the central limit theorem perfectly. As we're, we'll find out, no theory is perfect. There's always outliers. And we need to expect that, and we need to figure out how we deal with that or correct for that. But here what we can see is a value of what's called a cephalic index. I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. But on this index, and being an index variable, uh, normally an index variable, again, which we'll get to, but is uh, a ratio of one thing to another, a calculated index. It's purposely designed to pretty much form a normal curve every time. Um, and here what we see is that on the cephalic index, there's very few people who score between about 70 and 75. And then there's lots of people who score between 80 and 90. And then there's very few people between 90 and 95. It's a nice balance with a bulk of people in the middle here, very few people scoring low, a very few people scoring high. That's sort of what you look like in, when you're looking at a normal curve. So here, if we wanted to talk about someone's head, because that's what this is measuring. These people are more round-headed. These people are more narrow-headed. We could say that, I don't know, Joe has, we could, we could say, he has a pretty round head. Well, that's using words to describe that person's diversity, Joe's diversity. We could go on to say, though, with more precision, in fact, Joe's head is so round that it's rounder than 80% of the population. Those two combined, that's what I'm saying, is that allows us to talk about diversity with great precision. Okay, I want to move on and do a little bit of a digression into talking about the cephalic index because we're going to be using this um, in the course quite a bit. The cephalic index is one of the primary measures that Boaz used in his immigrant study. It is defined by head width, that's this, from ear to ear, divided by head length, which is from the 
top of your nose to the back of your head. So head width, head length, times 100. Now if you think about it, if you have a head width that is equal to, let's say, 100 millimeters, which would be really small, but it's easy to use 100, and a head length that's 100 millimeters, what do we have? These divide, they're the same, so that equals 1 times 100 is 100. That would be a perfect circle. Same in both dimensions. You have a circle. That's the basis. Circle is 100. If your head length is greater than the width, you're going to have a number that's less than 1 times 100 is going to be some value between 1 and 100. It's going to be less than 100. If you have a width that's bigger, you're dividing a bigger number than a smaller number, it's going to be greater than 100. So, the cephalic index measures the roundness of the skull with a value going from less than 100, from basically 1 to 100, and from 100 up. Okay. Why is that important? Well, here's why. Under race theory, at least at the time that Boaz was thinking about this and, and arguing about it, the cephalic index was really important because it was seen to be connected with intelligence or the potential for a, a person or a group of people to have a complex culture or a more civilized culture uh, because it was thought that longer-headed individuals, that is, individuals with greater length than breadth or a cephalic index less than 100, had larger frontal lobes, because the skull is long and so more frontal lobes were there, that those frontal lobes were the things that were directly related to intelligence and sort of civilized ability. And that therefore, people with lower cephalic indexes were more civilizable, had more complex cultures, and were smarter. That was the theory. Let's think about this. Does that theory have warrant? Does it have evidence? Well, in the late 19th century, it did. It was thought that this value could really predict intelligence and predict civilizability in part because the ones who were most, at that point, being measured, the most civilized, tended to have longer heads, which tended to be English or other Western Europeans at the time. With more um, analysis, it's come to be obvious in terms of evidence that there's a wide range of cephalic indices. There are some, depending on population, that have to have it that do have a genetic basis, but there really is a wide range. And if we use analysis of variance, we can see that. That's later in the course. And was in part developed to think about things like this by R. A. Fisher. We'll talk about him. Is there warrant? Today there's not warrant because we can't, we don't, because modern neuroscience doesn't place intelligence only in the frontal lobes. At the time, there was warrant because there was not, not good knowledge of how the brain works. And that theory made sense at the time. It's an important thing to think about as we talk about theories and about warrant and evidence. Because what's warranted changes over time as more evidence is gathered. So one of the things we have to be aware of in talking about theory is that it changes. And we, if we want to be scientific in our attitude, have to be able to change or willing 
to change our ideas based on evidence. It's an important point because we will, you do come across out in the world lots of people who talk scientifically but in fact are not willing to change their ideas based on new evidence. And there's also a critique, it seems, of scientific perspectives that, well, those scientists said this, and now they've changed their mind because of this new evidence. Yeah, that's what scientists do. That's what anthropologists should be doing. I want to point out one more thing in this, which is that anthropology in general has an unfortunate tendency to critique past anthropologists for their ideas. And we might say that people who promoted race theory um, were horrible people because that's what they thought. We have to remember that at the time, the theory they had had warrant and had evidence. Today we recognize it as a really terrible theory and one that had consequences for um, the exploitation and oppression of people that was really bad. But anthropology is supposed to be culturally relevant. That's one of the things we're supposed to do. And it's odd to me that we pitch cultural relativism to people all over the world, but we tend to not for people through time. The people in the past were not willing to be culturally relative to them. We judge them by current standards. And I think as anthropologists, that's really inappropriate. Were these guys wrong? <clears throat> yes. Did their work create um, damage? two people in the world, yes. But at the time, their ideas were warranted and had evidence. Might what we're doing today be seen of in a hundred years as being something terrible that hurt people? Yes. And we have to have the humility to know that and recognize that, I think. Uh, particularly as a discipline that, that preaches cultural relativism. Off my high horse now. And this is a good time for a short break. We'll be right back. And we are back. So this is that cephalic index image. And so what we can see from this is if we were to look at the curve, we see that it's a fairly normal curve. There's a little bit more up here and a little bit more down here. But what we see is that people tend to vary between about a cephalic index of about 70, long head, a cephalic index of about 95. What's, again, going back to the magic of this, is that if we go into a natural population, we can determine what the typical traits are of a population. And next time we'll learn that these are the mean, median, and mode, are those typical traits. We can also, by looking at this, look at how widely spread the population is, and we're going to find out next time that's variance and standard deviation. But in terms of Boaz's theory, the theory that the race theorists were positing is that there would be consistently a relationship between cephalic index and intelligence and civilization such that if we looked at the whole population of humans, these people up at the top with rounder heads should consistently score lower on some measure of civilization, and that would be very hard to measure, and some measure of intelligence, which we know from contemporary research is very hard to measure. But if they were measuring them however they did, that these people with rounder heads should 
consistently show lower met, uh, scores on any measure of civilization or intelligence and that these people with, round, with longer heads should consistently show uh, a greater uh, score on those measures of civilization and intelligence. That's what Boaz was able to demonstrate is not true in an interesting way. Because what he showed was that the cranial index of children born in the United States was longer in general than the cranial index of their parents. What that would mean is that cranial index is not a fixed genetic trait, but is cultural. We'll talk about what that means, but if you have this idea that there are fixed genetic traits that demonstrate relationships to other things like intelligence or civilization, and you can demonstrate that they're not fixed, then you can't say that it's those traits upon which those behaviors are based. There must be something else going on. That's what Boaz did. That was gave cultural theory warrant, or evidence at least, but it also took evidence away from and, and questioned the warrant behind race theory. That's how science works. In any case, we will talk more about that later. We need to move on to looking at some other forms of histograms, and particularly about skewness. So, this is what is called a left skewed histogram, or a negatively skewed histogram, because it skews to the left, or it skews to smaller numbers. This happens to be a histogram of stature, in the Boaz data set. And when there is a skew like this, it's telling us something about the underlying data. In this case, what this is telling us is a little bit trivial because we know that babies are born at some size, and it ranges, but they're not, you know, they're, they're in the foot and a half range, and then they grow up. And at some point, they stop growing. And so in here, you actually have probably a normal distribution or, or a fairly normal distribution of stature of adults, those who have stopped growing. And this is probably a fairly normal distribution, underlying distribution of children who are still growing. That explains why we have this skewed distribution. And remember, we're going back to the central limit theorem that states in a normal population with continuously distributed traits, you're going to have that nice, what's called a bell curve. Here we don't have that, so there must be some underlying factors that are skewing the distribution this way creating this long tail to the left. And in this case, it's because of children's growth. This is what's called a right skewed distribution because the tail goes out to the right or a positively skewed distribution because it's skewed towards more positive numbers. This is the histogram of age. We've looked at this before. This is from the Boaz data set. And these are the children of immigrants. Remember we talked about that. Those are the people under 20. That probably forms a fairly uniform distribution. And then adults are probably form a fairly uniform distribution. But there are a couple of other things going on in here that can help us to explain why we don't have a normal curve but have a skewed curve. One of them is because of sampling. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The other one is, though, that you have an absolute start point. Nobody can get less than zero years old. And when you have an absolute start point, you tend to get a right skew. Because 
you can't have less than this so whatever cases you have there sort of jump up and start the uh, start the, the curve skewing on the other side of this we have a few people who have lived very very long and so we can understand why there might be this skew off to the right because we know people tend to die you know somewhere in here but there are a few people who live for a long long time a really good example of a distribution that skews all the time is income and it's very understandable because income tends to it can start at zero right you can have zero income but most people tend to make about the same they make minimum wage and then they make you know twice minimum three four or five times and then after that it starts going down and you have your doctors and lawyers and then you have the really really rich people you have most people make an income you know in here in the United States today maybe it's all the people that make under two hundred and fifty or thousand dollars or something and then there's a few who are making up to a million and then there's the billionaires so it skews it all out to the right and, and again that's a violation of the central limit theorem it's a violation of this um, assumption that we get a nice normal bell curve and so it tells us something about the data and this is part of what I'm trying to emphasize in terms of visualizing and conceptually understanding the data if we don't get that nice bell curve it's telling us something about what's going on and we should be able to find an explanation for it that helps us to understand the data and what's going on okay this is a right skewed distribution but interestingly it is also what we call a bimodal distribution in that there are two modes two peaks we'll learn about modes next time but what they are is the most commonly occurring value and we have two frequently occurring values, two peaks. We call that bimodal. In this case, that's very easily understandable because we essentially have two different samples. We have youth born in the US and we have parents. So we, we can understand that it's a, this is a product, this strange distribution is a product of the sampling that was used to select cases for this study. We'll find other cases where we have bimodality and typically, at least in my experience, it's because we've mixed together two populations. That's typically what has happened and it tells us we need to separate those out for doing analysis. Um, and we will talk again more about that. I know I'm saying that a lot but we're early in the course and we are going to learn quite a lot in here. Okay. Let me show you an example of that. This is stature. And if you'll remember we have little kids, babies and little kids growing up and then we have adults. And what I posited with a theory that I think has warrant because we know children grow up and get bigger and we also know children stop growing and they stop growing at about 21 and that we have evidence for we have all kinds of physiological reasons behind it, behind it so the th that theory has warrant and evidence and what we could suggest is if we looked at just the adults that should form a normal curve or a relatively normal curve and so we'll make a cutoff at about 20 years old and here's what we get histogram of stature for those people over 21 so adults and look it becomes normal that's the same people that are in this distribution we we take those out because we're saying this is skewed because we have children in here who are growing take those children out and look we get a normal curve relatively normal curve that's important because in analysis we probably don't want to analyze children and adults the same way at least in terms of their stature we want to separate them out 
Uh, and we'll find that in all kinds of research. Um, we don't want to do analysis on skewed distributions because they, they tend to mess things up. We can't trust the results as well as if we have a normal curve. So if we were going to do some kind of statistical analyses here, we would probably want to pull out just the adults and analyze them. Anyway, I hope that's a nice illustration of how you can change a skewed curve into a normal one if you have under, an underlying theory with warrant, then you can do that. Okay, well that's the end of this lesson. Next time we are going to talk about measures of central tendency, basically mean, median, mode, variance, and standard deviation. We'll see you then.